Margot Rose. By December 1998, four years into our quixotic quest to get her pregnant, since being uterus-free, I had nowhere to grow a kid, my partner Pat and I were both over 40. We'd been to an array of doctors, fertility clinics, and naturopaths, each with a magic elixir to circumvent her rapidly declining quality and quantity of eggs. I'd given her about 50 shots in the butt to trick her body into ovulating on, on schedule. In sterile offices, I'd inseminated her with a dozen fat syringes of Mr. Perfect's pricey sperm. All to disappointment and no avail. Six months before this December day, we'd graduated to the big leagues of in vitro fertilization. Now, as I squint into a petri dish of squiggly blast cells, Pat is prepped for our last and final roll of the dice. Exhausted, out of money, we're going to stop after this last try and adopt. The blast cells go in, we go home. Two weeks later, after her blood test, Pat sits on the curb and cries. Sure, she's not pregnant. When she tells me this, I figure she knows her body and we steal ourselves for bad news. Days later, I'm heading west on Riverside Drive in the valley when my pager pings. It is 1999. <laughs> I see it's the IVF office. I rudely cut across two lanes. I jump out, call from the corner payphone. It is 1999. When our nurse clicks on, she says, Pat's pregnant. Pat's very pregnant. And finally, these cells, these miraculous cells, are growing inside her. And just like that, she's carrying twins. From the beginning of her high-risk pregnancy, we have bi-monthly visits to Dr. Tabish, our Omar Sharif-like OBGYN. <laughs> At every visit, he rubs Pat's belly with a disc like she's a magic lamp. And then he clips up a sonogram of the babies. Oh, definitely a girl and a boy, he proclaims early on. Perfect, we cheer. Then the pictures are grainy and cloudy, framed by an upside-down triangle. At first, there's just a, a nebulous blob with two heartbeats. Next, visit two blobs. Then the blobs are shapes, and then bodies with teeny alien-like heads attached. And then an arm by a torso, a curled-up leg, an itty-bitty penis. In her third trimester, Dr. Tabish clips up my favorite picture of all, clearly the girl, so Nora. Her head almost in profile and her miniature hand palm up and turned out like she's waving at us. The C-section is scheduled for August 20th, 1999. Pat's wheeled straight into her room and into bed. With 65 pounds added to her over six foot frame, she looks like a cheerful beached whale. Nurses pat around, friends trickle in, and I feel dizzy with the gravitas of the moment. And then the gurneys wheeled in, we head to the OR, where I'm given a mask, booties, and a seat by Pat's shoulder. Dobic, Dr. Tabish smiles like a party host. Suddenly, I feel panicky. Am I too close? Will I faint when I see Pat's blood and oozing innards? I blink, and right then, the doc reaches down into those very innards. Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. <laughs> he pulls out a kid. It's Will. For nine months, I've, from a hundred parents, I've, I've, I've heard this same thing. Nothing will ever be the same. I nodded and I smiled, but then I thought, well, I'm not the birth mother. Will the same lightning strike me? And sure enough, tears stream down my mask, and it's a new world. But the cord is wrapped around Will's neck like a cobra. He isn't breathing, and he's turned this horrifying blue. He's immediately surrounded by his waiting team. They free his neck in a flash, and they furiously whisk him to the corner. Dr. Tabish leans in to block Pat's view, but even through the blur of a dozen gloved hands, I can see Will. He's not pinking up. He's not getting enough breath. His tiny body's turning almost purple. I feel like I can't breathe either. And then on a barked command, his team circles and runs from the room in formation with Will in the middle like a football. 
I'm reeling with anxiety and freshly minted unconditional love, and that was just the fir first one. In a flash, Dr. Tabish reaches back into the top hat and pops up Nora, pink and loud as Will was blue and struggling for breath. Whisked to her corner team, she's inspected, aspirated, and then swaddled like a hot dog and passed to Pat, where she imme immediately settles in, calm and content. I'm struck by lightning again and weeping down to my booties. Her white peach fuzz hair is a killer, but when I see her eyes, they aren't just the blue that so many babies are born with. They're, they're brighter, they're bluer, luminescent, like they were lit from the inside out. When we're back and settled into a room, Will in the NICU, whenever she's not breastfeeding and Pat's asleep, I lie on my little cot, Nora on my chest. I pet her white blonde hair. Sometimes, I'm gonna drop my pages, sometimes craning around to see her face and those impossible blue eyes. Will stays under his giant oxygen tent for 10 days as the tear in his lung heals. He looks forlorn, but courageous. Sometimes I sit close and I whisper to him stories of heroes, just like he is. When his tent's lifted, he breathes like a champ. Triumphantly, we take him home to join his sister. Now, at 17, Will fiercely splatters away at his life like Jackson Pollock attacking a canvas. He studies home brewing and ancient Celtic witchery. He fearlessly jumps from every rooftop he encounters and can almost always make his sister laugh. And Nora, her eyes are still breathtakingly blue. She dances and sings, her long blonde hair falling like fresh water around her lovely face. She plays guitar. She writes painfully honest, amazing songs. Will is yin to Nora's yang. Their smiles and sentences often fit like jigsaw pieces. Their best friends, their worst enemies, and life witnesses. They grow and they grow and they stay. They change and they stay the same. Each one breaks my heart in some way every day. Pat and I, well, we've grown and we've changed too. But what doesn't change, what will never, ever change, is that we are best friends. We are in love with our kids. And we are in love with this family that we worked so hard to make. Thank you. Thank you.